Well, if you were with us last week in worship, either in person or online, then you heard Pastor Doug introduce for us times of transition. He briefly defined for us liminal or threshold experiences and then gave us some strategies for how to deal with them. And then, in preparation for, oh, say, about 130 people from our church who were going to be boarding planes last week, he... um, he introduced to us the quintessential threshold or liminal experience, that being the airport. Do you recall this illustration if you were with us last week? Nobody goes to the airport to stay, but rather those are places that we go to transition from one place to the next. And like most transitions in life, airports are rarely pleasant experiences for us. We don't like going through transition, but nonetheless, life abounds with transition. Well, we are going to be continuing on that theme this morning, and we're going to be zeroing in on one small subset of transitions, when dreams die. When I talk about dreams today, I don't mean to refer to those little adventures that you take in your mind when you drift off to sleep, either in the evening or the morning, but rather I mean to speak about the dreams that God gives to us through our sacred imaginations when we're able to envision and glimpse God's good future for us. Those types of dreams can be powerful things. It's those types of dreams that can chart the course of a life, that can orient our decisions, that can catalyze our actions. When we are in transitional times, it's dreams that clear away the fog, that enable us to find our true north. And this type of dream can actually change the world. About a generation ago, The world was changed by the dreams of one man. It was one of the pivotal movements of the civil rights movement. Dr. Martin Luther King, on August 28th of 1963, during the sweltering summer heat in Washington, D.C., with about a quarter of a million people gathered around, delivered his now famous I Have a Dream speech, through which he was able to cast a vision for what our nation could look like if we honored the image of God in every human being and if we lived into the values that we espoused as a nation. It was a catalytic, it was a powerful moment for our nation's history. Dreams can be powerful things and also they can be dangerous for the dreamer. Some four and a half short years later, on August 4th of 1968, Dr. King was assassinated because of his dream in part. The world didn't really know what to do when that happened because They had captured this vision, but they sort of wondered, did the dream die with Dr. King? Cities across the world experienced panic. Large cities like Chicago and Baltimore had riots, and everybody wondered what was going to happen to King's dream when he died. So dreams can be powerful, they can change the world, but they can be dangerous for the dreamer as well. Well, our biblical text for today is going to be about a dreamer. A dreamer whose dreams actually changed the entire course of the nation of Israel, but a dreamer whose dreams became somewhat dangerous for him as well. His story is one of the most vivid and almost quintessentially technicolor narratives of all of the Old Testament. Through it, we glimpse how God is providentially leading all areas of our lives. Joseph was the son of a man by the name of Jacob, who was also a dreamer. Jacob had 12 sons, and much to uh, Joseph's brother's chagrin, Jacob was by far the favored son. I don't know if you have one of these kids in your family, the favored kid, the golden child. That was Joseph. Even at the age of 17, he had this annoying habit of seemingly always doing what was right, which only made his brothers matter. For example... This is one thing that Joseph did that his brothers didn't like so much. When his brothers would make poor decisions and get into trouble, Joseph was the guy who would report back to his father, Jacob, about their poor decisions, like the time that they stole the car and didn't ask dad's permission first, and the time that they experimented with bottle rockets. Joseph was the tattletale for his brothers. He let his father know exactly what was going on with them. And if that wasn't bad enough... Joseph was the favorite son because he was the only son at the time that he was born of his uh, father's beloved wife, Rachel. And because of this, his father gave to him, and you may recall this, his father gave to him a symbol of his love for him in the form 
of a technicolor dream coat, as Andrew Lloyd Webber once famously wrote about. This robe, or the technicolor dream coat, became a symbol of the special place that he had in his father's heart, and it made his brother's blood boil. And so as a result, they couldn't say anything positive about him. In fact, I was told when I was growing up that if you don't have anything positive to say, then don't say anything at all, right? Well, Joseph would have been better off if his brothers took that advice because the scriptures tell us that they never had a kind word about him. And here's the straw that broke the camel's back. Joseph began to have dreams. And what's worse, he shared his dreams with his brothers. For instance... He went to his brothers once and said, hey guys, I had this dream. And he said, we were binding sheaves of grain out in the field when suddenly my sheaf rose and stood upright while your sheaves gathered around mine and bowed down to it. And his brothers said, okay, so let me get this straight. We're going to bow down to you? Is that what the, this dream is all about? Well, that wasn't the only dream that he had. He had a dream to follow that one up. This time he said, I had a dream and the sun and the moon and 11 stars all turned and bowed down to me. And the sun and the moon presumably were mom and dad, right? And even Joseph's dad at that point went, wait a minute, are you saying that mom and dad, like, that we're going to be bowing down to you as well? And Joseph's dad, Jacob, rebuked him because of this. So Joseph was a dreamer whose family looked at him and thought either he's delusional and having these like delusions of grandeur or, or maybe he's just a narcissist. But nonetheless, these dreams would get Joseph into trouble. Our scripture reading comes from the latter half of Genesis chapter 38, excuse me, rather 37. We're going to be reading verses 12 and 13 and skipping ahead to verses 17 through 28. Hear now the word of the Lord. Now Joseph's brothers had gone to graze their father's flocks near Shechem. And Israel said to Joseph, as you know, your brothers are grazing the flocks near Shechem. Come, I am going to send you to them. And skipping ahead to verse 17. So Joseph went after his brothers and found them near Dothan. But they saw him in the distance. And before he reached them, they plotted to kill him. Here comes that dreamer, they said to each other. Come, let's kill him and throw him into one of these cisterns and say that a ferocious animal devoured him. Then we'll see what comes of his dreams. When Reuben, one of his brothers, heard this, he tried to rescue him from their hands. Don't take his life, he said. Don't shed any blood. Throw him into this cistern here in the wilderness, but don't lay a hand on him. Reuben said this to rescue him from them. And take him back to his father. So when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe, the ornate robe he was wearing. And they took him and threw him into the cistern. The cistern was empty. There was no water in it. And as they sat down to eat their meal, as you do when you throw your brother into a cistern. <laughs> as they sat down to casually partake of their lunch, they looked up and saw a caravan of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead. Their camels were loaded with spices, balm, and myrrh, and they were on their way to take them down to Egypt. Judah said to his brothers, what will we gain if we kill our brother and cover up his blood? Come, let's sell him to the Ishmaelites and not lay our hands on him. After all, he is our brother, our own flesh and blood. His brothers agreed. So when the Midianite merchants came by, his brothers pulled Joseph up out of the cistern and sold him for 20 shekels of silver to the Ishmaelites, who took him down to Egypt. Here ends the reading. It's a narrative that frequents the scriptures. It shows up time and time again. The father sends the beloved son to his brothers and the brothers reject him. It's actually the story that echoes in the life of Jesus, isn't it? God the Father sends the only beloved son to his brothers, to all of humanity, and humanity rejected and crucified Jesus. And so too, it's the story of Joseph. The father sends his beloved son to his brothers 
And they see him, and their scornful gaze falls upon him when he's still a long way off. It was probably hard not to notice him. I mean, he's the one guy in the middle of the desert wearing the Technicolor dream coat. He looks like a walking disco ball. So they spied him from a long ways away, and while it took him time to walk to them, they hatched their despicable plan. At first they said, well, let's just kill him. Then what will become of his dreams? His dreams will die with him. Until his brother Reuben piped up, and Reuben said, no, 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 you guys, we can't kill him. He's our brother, right? Don't lay a hand on him. Let's just throw him in a well. Probably, by the way, Reuben wasn't actually the most, um, oh, he wasn't probably motivated by the best possible things here. A couple of chapters earlier, Reuben had done some things to make his father pretty upset, and he wasn't on the best of terms with his dad. So it may be that Reuben isn't trying to just save his brother from his other brothers, but rather he's trying to rescue his beloved brother, his father's beloved son, so that when he returns him back to dad, dad welcomes Reuben back into good graces. So Reuben says, well, let's not kill him. And then Judah pipes up, yeah, why would we kill him when we can sell him? He's worth more to us alive than dead, right? And so they throw him into a well. And I sort of imagine him down at the bottom of the well, those dreams that he was having, you know, echoing around in his mind, even as his voice is echoing off the cold, dank, dark walls of the well. And he's wondering, are these dreams ever going to come about? Or was that just a figment of my imagination? At first, Joseph had these dreams that his brothers were going to be bowing down to him, and now they're just peering down through this hole in the ground, looking at their helpless brother in the bottom of a well. This will begin for Joseph a long and humbling journey where he will experience lots of hardship. He's sold into slavery for 20 shekels of silvery, silver, brought down to Egypt. And as he gets down to Egypt, he's purchased by a wealthy slave owner by the name of Potiphar. Potiphar quickly recognizes that Joseph has all these administrative gifts, and so he quickly elevates him to a place of prominence in the home. Joseph is put in charge over all of his household. That is until another plot is hatched, this time by Potiphar's wife, who accuses Joseph of doing something he did not do. And Potiphar, of course, is livid. And so Joseph, for a second time, is thrown down into a pit. This time, a prison. Another hole in the ground. All in all, Joseph will spend 14 years, forgive the pun, in the pits. First in a cistern, and then in a prison. All during which he must be going God, I thought you said that this dream was going to come about, but, but now what? I wonder how many of you have ever walked the boulevard of broken dreams? I wonder how many of you have ever had an experience where you had a dream about what was going to come about, and then one day that dream came crashing to the ground? I have a number of friends who have gone through this over the course of their life. Let me tell you just about one of them. It was a couple, and they got married, and um, even before they got married, they were planning out what their future was going to look like. They were dreaming about their future, and they had this whole plan. They were going to have this Victorian-style house that had a full front porch that wrapped around the side of it. They were going to have a, a white picket fence around their yard and an old oak tree in front that had a tire swing where their two children could swing and sing during the summer days. Only they got married, and after two or three years of trying and trying and waiting and waiting and hoping and praying, it became clear that they were never going to be able to have children. So this dream that they had seemed like it would never come about. I have another, another couple that I knew who they had worked hard their whole lives. And their plan was, we're going to retire young and we're going to move someplace beautiful and enjoy retirement in the sun and the fun. So he retires, and shortly after he retired, as unfortunately is so common, he had a heart attack, and he died before they ever had a chance to move. And now she was left wondering, okay, well, we had this dream together of what our future was going to look like, and, and, and now what? I have another friend, another friend who about two decades ago, almost 20 years ago, he made his vows to his wife. He said, I love you in good times and in bad, in joy and in sorrow, in sickness and in health, as long as we both shall live. Three months ago, 
One day his wife came home and she handed him an envelope full of papers and she asked him for a divorce. So I talked to him on the phone and I said, I said, what are, you, what are you going through? What are you experiencing in this moment? And he said, I never dreamed my life would come to this. Have you ever been there? Walked the boulevard of broken dreams. Could be a lost relationship, a loss of a job, a personal failure, a health crisis. Maybe it's not personal to you. Maybe it's the loss of a corporate dream. There are many people around the United States today who are wondering if the American dream is a figment of a previous imagination never to be fully realized. Have you ever walked the boulevard of broken dreams? How then are we to engage with this? Well, actually, the good news is, if you've walked the boulevard of broken dreams, you're not actually alone. The scriptures are full of people for whom this exact crisis has hit. And it's natural for us, when we walk this lowly road, to wonder, where is God in the midst of it? In fact, if you read through the scriptures, oftentimes you'll see the prayers of people who are walking this uh, road of boulevard of broken dreams, and you'll, and you'll see that when they are in that moment, they ask, where is the Lord? Consider, for example, Psalm 28. Psalm 28 begins with this plea to God because there's a crisis coming. The psalmist writes, to you, Lord, I call. You are my rock. Don't turn a deaf ear to me. For if you remain silent, in other words, if, if you're not around, I will be like those who go down to the pit. Hear my cry for mercy as I call to you for help, as I lift my hands towards your most holy place. Now, the truth is, this psalm was actually written by King David generations after the time of Joseph, but it might as well have been written by Joseph, calling out to the Lord from the pits of despair and wondering where God was. But in the scriptures, when people wonder where God is in the midst of suffering, you'll find that just a short couple of verses later, there is often a joyful and even hopeful reminder that even in the darkest times, God is with us. Psalm 28, just a few verses later, reads this. Praise be to the Lord, for he has heard my cry for mercy. The Lord, has, the Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart trusts in him and he helps me. My heart leaps for joy and with my song I praise him. The Lord is the strength of his people, a fortress of salvation for his anointed one. So it's natural to wonder where God is in the midst of hard times. And also, our scriptural forefathers remind us that even in the midst of the hard times, that God is already there and working on our behalf. Today, today the faith of many has a tacit assumption sort of attached to it. We would, we would never probably say this out loud, but if you ask a lot of people about what their faith is really about, it may sound something like this. There is a God who loves you, and because God loves you, God wants you to have a good life. God loves you and because God loves you, he wants you to have good things. There's a sociolo sociologist who wrote about this phenomenon. He's, he studied the, the expression of faith for a lot of people who are younger in their faith. And as he was studying their expression of faith, he came to summarize all the things that he was hearing from them with three different words. He called their faith moralistic therapeutic deism. This is basically what the idea is. Moralistic. God wants you to be a good person. Therapeutic, God wants you to be happy. And the idea of deism is really that, uh, yeah, God created everything, but God's not really that involved in everyday life. And this is the faith that Christian Smith says undergirds much of the world today in terms of how people are at least talking about their faith. The problem is this. If your faith is moralistic, therapeutic deism, it has no hope to offer you on the boulevard of broken dreams. It just doesn't. And here's why. Because if God wants you to be happy, what happens when you're not happy? Either that means God isn't good or God isn't around. And if God is a deistic God, in other words, if God created everything but isn't tremendously involved in daily life, then when life is going well, God's not really close to you. And so especially when life isn't going well, God's not near you either. This common expression of faith that exists in America today has no hope to offer us when we're on the boulevard of broken dreams. But it's not the faith 
that our forefathers, our ancestors in the faith, actually proclaimed. So let's look at the story of Joseph, and I want to tell you about the great hope that Joseph reveals to us when we're on that boulevard of broken dreams. When dreams die, here's the first thing that Joseph's story tells us. That God is near to us even when we're in the pits. Even when life isn't going well, God is near to us. If you just read through Joseph's story in chapter 39, just a couple of chapters later, here's what happens. It says, but while Joseph was there in prison, literally still in the pits, the Lord was with him and he showed him kindness and granted him favor in the eyes of the prison warden. The Lord was with Joseph and gave him success in whatever he did. When Joseph was at his lowest point and when he would cry out to the Lord, his confident assurance was this, that God was with him and that in in surprising ways, God was actually showing him kindness and favor in those moments. Now, don't hear me wrong on this. Even though God was being kind to him and giving him favor, it didn't mean that life was always going to be easy for Joseph. He actually spent 14 years in prison, right? So just because God was with him and showing him kindness didn't mean that he got out, and it didn't mean that everything just went smoothly for him. If you keep following the story along, eventually there are two guys that get in trouble with Pharaoh. Remember, he's down in Egypt. Two guys get in trouble with Pharaoh. One of the guys is the cupbearer, the guy that tests Pharaoh's wine to make sure it's not poison. The other guy was a baker who made delicious treats for Pharaoh. Both of these guys get in trouble with Pharaoh. They both get thrown into a pit. And uh, they're with Joseph in prison, and they start having these dreams. Remember, Joseph was a dreamer. He can interpret dreams. So they tell Joseph his dreams, and Joseph interprets them to the first guy, to the cupbearer. He says, look, everything's going to be fine. And in a short period of time, you're going to get out of here. You're going to resume to your position in Pharaoh's court. And to the baker, he says, unfortunately, things aren't going to go well for you. And you're not going to make it out of here. And truth is revealed to Joseph in this regard because that's exactly what happens. The cupbearer returns to Pharaoh. The baker loses his life in prison. Now you would think if God was being kind to Joseph and showing favor to him that that cupbearer would go straight to Pharaoh and tell Pharaoh about this amazing guy that he met in prison and help Joseph get out of there. But it's another two years that Joseph will be in the pit and the scriptures say that the cupbearer forgot all about him. The truth is that when we go through times when dreams die, God is present with us, that he is showing kindness and surprising uh, favor to us, but that doesn't mean that things are always going to go well or that our times are going to end any time soon, but rather God is going to be with us, nearer than our next breath, right alongside us, walking the journey with us. So when dreams die, God is near to us. The second thing that this story reveals to us is that when we are in times of crisis and uncertainty, when dreams die, that God will give us wisdom. You'll recall that dreams help us to to chart a course for our lives, to make decisions for the future, to catalyze our actions. And so when dreams die, oh, we start to wonder what the fog of the future looks like. Do you remember a couple years ago when the global pandemic happened and, and a global dream had died that somehow medicine had advanced to a certain point where we would never have something like this happen. And and then we wondered what the future was going to look like and we couldn't see two feet ahead of us. Everything was just a fog in front of us. And that's what happens when dreams die. And so when dreams die, we need something to orient our lives around. And in the midst of times when dreams die, we can turn to the Lord and he gives us wisdom. When dreams die, God will give us wisdom. If you look to the New Testament, there's a wonderful speech given by a man by the name of Stephen who actually is about to lose his life. Uh, He's going to be the first Christian martyr. In Acts chapter 7, he starts to recount how God has been working throughout history providentially to bring about his purposes. And he actually talks about Joseph's story. And in Joseph's story, he says this. He said, God was with him and rescued him from all of his troubles. God gave Joseph wisdom and enabled him to gain the goodwill of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. The New Testament also tells us 
that anybody who is in Christ, who is lacking wisdom and is unsure about what the future looks like, can go to God and ask for wisdom, and God graciously gives to us his wisdom without showing any partiality. That's the book of James, chapter 1. So in the midst of times when dreams die, God gives to us wisdom. God is present with us. He is showing us his kindness, and he is working his favor out in our lives, and he gives us wisdom. And there's a third thing that we can count on when dreams die, and it's this. When dreams die, God is always working his purposes out. If you continue to follow the story of Joseph, it is beautiful in all of its intricacies and all the twists and turns that it takes. Remember, Joseph has interpreted a dream for a cupbearer who spends two years at Pharaoh's side and doesn't mention Joseph once until Pharaoh starts having bad dreams of his own. And he calls upon all the magicians and enchanters to come and try to interpret his dreams, and nobody can interpret Pharaoh's dreams. And the cupbearer goes, oh, oh, yeah, two years ago I met this guy in prison, and he was able to tell me my dream and another guy's dream, and he was right on. So Pharaoh calls for Joseph. Joseph interprets both dreams that Pharaoh has as to say that there is going to be a time of great prosperity in Egypt, followed up by a time of famine. And so Joseph, using all the administrative gifts that Potiphar first saw in him, charts a course for the future and says, here's how we're going to handle this. So in the midst of seven years of famine, they had stockpiled all this food, and Egypt is looking pretty good. But the surrounding region is hit really hard by the famine. And by the way, remember that family that threw him in a well several uh, years ago, almost 14 years ago? They're in the surrounding region of Canaan, and they're struggling to make ends meet and to make life work. So where do they go? They go to the place that has all the food. So the brothers come to Egypt, and who do they find themselves in front of? The person that that Pharaoh had promoted to the second highest position in all the kingdom, their former brother Joseph. And they don't recognize him this time because he's not wearing that coat. He's probably wearing Egyptian garments, and he's probably going by a different name, and he's speaking in the native tongue of the Egyptians So they don't recognize him. And then comes this great and meaningful reveal, that one of the most um, evocative and emotional parts of all the scriptures, when Joseph finally reveals his true identity to his brothers and he weeps bitterly and he's just so overjoyed to see them, he can't keep it in any longer. It's so powerful. And his brothers are terrified. Why? Because 14 years earlier, they had thrown him into a well. And they're wondering, what's he gonna do? Now, Joseph could have easily gotten bitter, couldn't he? I mean, his brothers threw him in a well. They plotted against him and conspired against him. Potiphar's wife threw him into prison. He spent 14 years in prison. The cupbearer forgot about him. He could have been bitter with God because he spent 14 years of his prime in his life in the midst of a prison in a dark cell. He could have gotten bitter along the way, and yet he doesn't. And in a remarkable gesture of grace, He forgives his brothers, and and the scriptures give us an indication as to why he does this. Looking to the very end of his story, Genesis chapter 50, he says this, you, his brothers, intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. In other words, Joseph was able to see the thread through his life of how even in the darkest points of his life, God was providentially working his purposes out. Here's the good news. You may be in a situation right now where things don't look great. And those are tough places to be. But we have a God who can take even the most harsh and terrible things that we go through and bring about his redemption. God is not done with you yet. Ultimately, this is why Christianity has more hope to offer the world than any other philosophy or world system. Because the truth of Christianity is this, that God sent to the world his beloved son, just like the father sent his son to his brothers. God sent his beloved son to the world and he gave his life for us. And one of the worst things that could be done, humanity rejecting God to the point of crucifixion, God took that terrible thing and through it, Christ was raised from the dead and gives us a hope for an eternal life with God. God can providentially and sovereignly take the terrible things that happen in our lives, the times when dreams die or we find ourselves in the pit or we walk the boulevard of broken dreams, whatever expression you want to put to it, 
And God can bring about his redemption. Here's the good news. Wherever you're at today, if you're in the bottom of a pit or you're on the top of the world, God is near to you. More than that, when you need God and you go to him and say, Lord, I need your wisdom to get me through this season of life, he'll graciously give it to you. And even in the good times and the bad times, God is providentially working his purposes out in your life. It's tough when dreams die. For the person whose dream has come crashing to the ground, the tendency is to say, well, then I'm just never going to dream again. But God doesn't let us do that either. By the power of the Spirit, he encourages us to dare to dream anew. I don't know where you are today. I'm not sure what you're going through But I know in whom we trust, even Jesus Christ, our risen Lord. Would you pray with me? Holy God, we are so grateful to you. We're grateful, Lord, because you give us an enduring hope that no matter what season we're in, whether it's a transitional threshold, liminal season where hardship has come or whether we're doing well, We thank you, Lord, that we can trust that you are near to us. Lord, none of us has the wisdom we need to live this life as we ought, but we thank you that you have given us your son, Jesus, and that you promise that you'll give us a wisdom to live our daily lives. We ask, O Lord, humbly, that you would give us that wisdom and that you'd lead us along our life's journey. And we thank you, O Lord, that you're not done with us yet. And that you'll take even the bad portions of our lives that we look at now and think, how could this ever happen? And you will bring such a beautiful ending to the story as we cannot imagine. And we ask, O oh Lord, that you give us eyes of faith to see this. And pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen.